Thank you, Gary. So can uh, everyone hear me? Perfect. Go good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Gary, for the invitation. Uh, I mean, we don't do that very often. <laughs> um, so uh, Jarek and myself, we are both working for, uh, in a group uh, uh, named Biomed IT. And today we are going to uh, tell you our story or our journey uh, to the Rust Tough world. Ah, by the way, here you will see um, this is the URL of the presentation, so you can find here uh, all the side of the slide. Um, the outline looks as following. So first, I will uh, say a couple of words on the Biomunity mission. Then I will say uh, uh, why we decided to go for for Python in the first attempt, and what uh, what. What, do, uh, what we learned by using Python in the first attempt and um, how we try to improve our tools with, with Rust. Then uh, we are talking about maintenance, uh, how is maintenance implemented in our project. Then let's talk about future plans of, uh, of the tools and maybe we can have inter some interesting discussion because we still have uh, open questions there. And at the final step, we will just summarize what we have seen. So uh, this is how Biomed IT uh, looks like. So Biomed IT is basically uh, an infrastructure which should link data providing institution with researcher. So basically it's about how can we transfer in a very secure manner, because we are in Switzerland, data from point A to point B. Um, so this infrastructure is composed of three nodes, one node in Zurich, one in Basel, and one in Lausanne. Um, we, the developer, the developer team, the BVIC team, um, our mission is to develop some tools helping there. So we are mainly maintaining two, uh, two softwares. The first one is Portal, which is kind of project user management web application. And the second tool is SET. No, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, what are SET characteristics? Uh, so SET is a end-to-end -end encryption tool and data signing tool. This means if you want to send data to someone, you will use your private key to sign the data and you will use the public key of the recipient to encrypt the data. So uh, by doing so, we are really making sure that only the right people uh, do access the data. So we are using an asymmetric encryption. Um, then as compression, the data are compressed as far as we can. So we are using uh, zip and we are sending one file and this one file is a zip file and uh, does contain everything. Then we support, um, um, we support two transfer protocols, SFTP and S3. Okay, and um, actually S3 is pretty new. Um, but um, it's planned to be implemented and uh, running by end of this year uh, on the three nodes. Then because our uh, landscape, our user landscape is pretty broad, so we have to support uh, all possible platforms. So we are uh, supporting the, the main three, Linux, MacOS and Windows. We are offering a CLI and a GUI, graphic user interface, and Basically, you can consider SET as a facility tool. So, um, but you could, of course, of course, only use CLI commands like GPG to, to do the job. For, I'm talking about the encryption. And for the transfer, you could use SFTP, which, is, uh, which could be found on pretty any platform. So, but our job here is, uh, in the SET is to facilitate uh, all, all the steps, to heighten the complexity of all the steps. Um, 
because we are engineers, uh, I mean, we try to keep it pretty simple. And uh, as I said, to hide the complexity to the, to the end users. I will show you an image afterwards. So now if I, uh, I said we are sending one, one file, if now we have a look at this one file, uh, the file looks as following. So this is a zip file. Uh, we decided to go for zip because uh, zip file has a, uh, uh, is handling file, uh, is handling compression file by file and is, it's easier to implement things like streaming. Um, we have, the file is composed of a metadata JSON. Then we have the metadata JSON signature. So this means it's a detached signature. So this file is signed but it's still readable by humans. This is needed. We need some, uh, uh, the file in the readable form because we are making some checks at different points during the workflow. Um, but of course, if when, you are, when we verify the, the file, we need both files. And so we can ensure that, for instance, the human readable file has not been modified by third party. Then we have the main interesting uh, file, which is a data file. And this one contains um, the data which should, be, which should be sent. As you see at the end, we have the checksum SHA. Uh, having a deeper look at that one, I think it's coming here, yeah, exactly. So if now I open the metadata JSON, the human readable file, you will see it contains some metadata like the sender fingerprints, the recipient fingerprints, um, checksum of the data file, and things like transfer ID and version, uh, no, transfer ID and purpose, they are specific to biomedity infrastructure, but you could use set, we wanted to support this use case, you could use set uh, as private person, so outside of the biomedity context. And I already did it to, to, to send um, encrypted and signed data to someone. Having a look at the checksum SHA uh, 256 file is just a file which lists the content of the data file with the checksum. So you see here we are, um, we are making sure that the file reached the right person and we are making sure that the file have not been corrupted or are, in, uh, are correct. Oh, no. Okay, so um, the first tool has been developed in Python. I mean, I was not part of this decision, but uh, probably the developer who decided to go for, part, part, uh, for Python had, uh, had a best command in Python. And um, I can say I'm, it was not a bad decision because uh, Python is a, a quite easy language to learn. And you have as well GUI support, graphic user interface support. So it was pretty easy to develop set. So here you see a screenshot of, uh, of the GUI component of set. Uh, it's composed of uh, five tabs. For, so first you will, as a sender, you will encrypt the data. Then you will transfer them. And on the other side, you will, would like to decrypt the data. So you will use the tab in the middle, decrypt. And we have another tab for key management. So for download the key or uploading the keys to the key server. And of course, uh, settings for the app. Um, set support all the main operating system, um, including CentOS 7. And this is really uh, cumbersome. Um, CentOS, CentOS 7 is an old operating system, will reach end of life by middle of next year. But I mean, this is not our decision. We have to support the, the, um, the operating system where the projects are deployed. I mean, hopefully, I mean, I have been told that they, will, they plan to move away from CentOS 7 by end of the year. Because we have to support CentOS 7, we have to use, uh, we have to support as well very older version of Python, so 3.7 in this case. And even worse, we have to support GNU-PG version 2.0.22, which, uh, 
which already reached its end of life in 2017. If you ask, if you ask you because we are, why we have GPG here, I mean it's a prerequisite. Maybe I didn't, I forgot to mention it. It, but uh, if you want to use set, you have to install Python, and you you will need a GPG uh, executable command. I mean we try, we develop a GPG Lite, which kind of a wrapper around the GPG command, but still it's a requirement to have GPG installed. Okay, after a couple of years, we learned uh, some lessons with this, um, uh, with this tool. So we find out that cross-platform support is really difficult, uh, especially if one of the developers does not have uh, any Mac. I think the team was pretty happy when I popped in with my Mac, right? Okay. <laughs> Maybe not Gary, but... Uh, <laughs> um, and um, then, because we have some external dependency requirements like Python or GNUPG, uh, user expect from you that you have a good command of this, of this dependency. So you, have, you better master them. And I mean, our users are typically uh, data scientists, so not, not really developers. So, and for some of them, uh, app installation or upgrades uh, could be quite challenging. So, what should we do? So we find out that uh, our main problem is a GNU-PG. This is our most problematic dependency. We should really try to get rid of it. One idea I, uh, I came with, but no one was really happy about it, was to rewrite everything from scratch in JavaScript and having actually set running in the browser, because nowadays everything is a browser and the browser is a new OS. So no more, um, no more requirement or prerequisite like uh, Python or OpenPGP. However, there, there is even uh, OpenPGP JavaScript implementation, but I mean, um, I mean, we didn't try, but we, think, we have to think about it. I mean, having a, a browser, uh, you, the app running in the browser, you could maybe face other challenges like, uh, I mean, typically the, data which travel over the wire are pretty big, huge. So one gigabyte, one terabyte, and I'm not sure the browser will be able to upload this kind of file in a very, very reliable way. Um, then, finally, uh, we decided to go with Rust. So we decided to uh, proceed in a so surgical replacement of specific workflow. So you know, I explained to you that we have encryption, transfer and description, and um, um, thanks to the Python bindings you have uh, in Rust, you can actually replace only part of the code and not everything in once. This gives you, this gives you, this gives you some time to learn Rust and uh, not surprising in a better way the, the, user, the end user. Why we came to this decision, I would say it's a, it's a couple of uh, um, uh, hazards, a couple of, uh, a couple of factors, but a bit, a bit luck, I would say. First of all, we used to have Gary in our team, and Gary is a Rust fanatic. And, we <laughs> and uh, one day we spent uh, uh, one, one full day with him, and he tried to, uh, to show us how great Rust is. And I, I have to say, we get pretty motivated and we wanted more. So this was the first factor. The second factor was we, want, uh, we wanted to get rid of uh, GPG and we had been observing uh, Sequoia PGP for a long time but uh, we're not releasing the version 1.0.0 uh, and we were, waiting, we were waiting for this version. And by 2020, they finally released version 1.0.0. So for us, it was really, okay, let's do it. And now I will pass the word to, to Jacques, yeah, which will explain to you the next step. Thanks, Christian. 
Okay, so as Christian explained, uh, we decided to go the Rust way. And uh, yeah, uh, probably you, I mean, for sure, already noticed that a lot of software is being the, uh, rewritten now in Rust for all different purposes. And yeah, it's not all, only a common pattern in software development. It turns out that the biology does the same. It seems that crab is a perfect life form, so everything should uh, um, uh, should uh, uh, destined to be uh, become a crab. Um, so, but. Other than uh, crabs being cool, uh, there are other reasons why uh, it, for us, at least for us, it was a, a good idea to rewrite it in Rust. So, I mean, as Christian mentioned, uh, one of the biggest problems we were facing was supporting different operating systems, basically porting the application and distributing it. And with Rust, this, uh, this is greatly simplified. You can uh, compile an uh, entire application basically to a single file executable, statically linked, so you have no problems with other uh, dependencies that and you also need, don't need to bother users to, uh, to install those dependencies, support different versions, which we noticed that was a terrible uh, maintenance cost. Uh, in terms of uh, security, uh, Rust is secure by design, which uh, is partially important for SET itself, but even more importantly for the uh, libraries that we are using that are doing the heavy lifting. So, and encryption should be secure, right? So it's great that a library that we are using for it, uh, it's implemented in Rust. Uh, correctness, so uh, capturing bugs earlier. And what I mean by that is like in Python, we often only learned about bugs when users actually created a ticket uh, telling us, hey, I, uh, it doesn't work, I don't know why. And then we had to start investigating it. And in most cases, uh, those problems were yeah, specific to the platform. And in Rust, we noticed that a lot of those problems show up at the compilation time. So either the code won't compile at all, or you would need to use a different library because uh, one library would not support, let's say, Windows. So at least we'll, you learn early, so uh, before you ship it to, to the end users, which yeah, also saves a lot of, of time in the long run. And as Christian mentioned, the two big enablers were uh, the libraries uh, that, uh, that are now available uh, in the Rust ecosystem. So the main, the most important one is Sequoia PGP, which I will uh, shortly mention in one of the later slides, and Pio3, which allows for an easy integration of Rust into Python. And yeah, uh, actually in set we use a lot of other uh, libraries. Uh, so yeah, it's great that the Rust ecosystem supports uh, uh, all of it, uh, actually all of the two that we need, but those two, I would say they are the, uh, the biggest enablers for us. Yeah, but at the beginning, at least it's not all great. So uh, uh, there were some challenges. So that was the first serious Rust project for, I think all of us. So Gary helped us a lot, but uh, uh, left, uh, let us to, uh, to try developing uh, ourselves. Uh, so. What we learned is that you need to have be motivated and spend some time on it. And it's, it's very useful to have an expert if you are stuck. So the compiler only give you, can you give you so much of an uh, error output. And uh, so the second point is most important in transition periods. So as Christian mentioned, we, uh, the plan is to replace uh, the Python app piece by piece, which means that uh, at, uh, in this transition period, uh, the same functionality needs to be first uh, re-implemented in Rust and still being maintained in Python. So yeah, so in this in this time uh, you need to support both. Uh, but once uh, you get rid of the Python code, then this uh, this uh, double maintenance cost uh, disappears. Uh, so yeah, as I already hinted, uh, that's the, uh, pretty much the core of uh, of set. Uh, so the Sequoia PGP library. And it's yeah, so now it's no longer that new, but still it's a re relatively newcomer to the open PGP world. And we treat it as a complete replacement of uh, GNU PG, we, yeah, which has many problems, but for us the biggest one was uh, the um, distribution and uh, platform support. Uh, yeah, so the 1.0 uh, oh, release was uh, already like more than two years ago. Uh, so far we noticed it's extremely stable and it comes uh, especially in contrast to GNU PG as a library first approach, meaning that the developers uh, um, 
uh, develop mainly the library and the surrounding tools, uh, they, uh, uh, in, and, and also other tools, and in those tools they use uh, this library as anybody else would use. So we pretty much have the same uh, experience uh, with the library as they do. Um, and yeah, the experience is, is very good so far. And the community is very active and supportive. We even noticed that once we are discussing the um, uh, next feature that we want to implement uh, on our GitLab issue tracker, and then one of the Sequoia developers just showed up uh, uh, suggesting us a different approach because they were actually creating a, a new uh, uh, sub-project that, yeah, that, that really actually simplified um, the feature that you wanted to develop, so that was actually great. I not I don't know why, uh, like how he came up, uh, how he found our issue, but yeah, I appreciate that he did. And uh, Sequoia, it's not just one project; it's an entire ecosystem. So you will find tools like SQ, which is a command line interface to Sequoia that can do uh, similar things like uh, the uh, G uh, GPG uh, uh, command line interface can. Uh, you also have uh, the uh, a verifying key server, uh, also written by the same team, uh, which holds the public uh, server, this keys openpgp.org, that actually we do use uh, for Biomat IT. They also have tools for uh, integrating uh, with GNU PG, so to help to transition to Sequoia, and also like for make clients, and there is more of it. So yeah, um, that I wanted to give a shout out for them because it's a great project. And second um, big one for us was uh, Pio3, which provides a very easy way to expose uh, Rust, uh, Rust functions, Rust uh, structs to, uh, to Python and just use it as you would use any other Python code. And there's also a sister project to it called Maturin, which uh, greatly simplifies um, the deployment part. So, uh, so, given your uh, Rust project with uh, 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 with a, a bit of Pio three code, you can uh, build it into Python packages that you just uh, yeah. If you're familiar with pip, you just uh, sorry with Python, then you just pip install it and 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 you have it. So now I will very br briefly go over how the project is uh, is more or less organized and uh, a high level at uh, a high level how uh, how it looks. So we have two main um, so in in the repository we have two uh, crates. The main one containing the library, uh, which implements pretty much all the functionality, and it also includes the binary part. So uh, uh, yeah, so. The, the lowest hanging fruit for us for like full, full transition to uh, Rust-based tool was to first start, start with a CLI. So that's why along writing the library part uh, that does all the actual work, we also run the, uh, a binary uh, that users could use, uh, hopefully soonish. And there is a second crate set RS, which only is concerned about uh, providing Python bindings. So it's a very thin wrapper. Uh, over the, the main set crate. And here's an example, so still it's unreleased uh, code, but yeah, in uh, it would pretty much uh, have similar experience I, I would expect uh, later. So uh, that's a CLI, uh, a purely, uh, purely now done in Rust, where you can create your uh, encrypted packages, decrypt them, transfer, you can manage your keys. And now, uh, yeah, and um, because of a Sequoia philosophy, you could also use other tools to interact with uh, the keys. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, it's it's a very nice because then the tools are uh, interchangeable. And this, uh, so this uh, command line interface actually nicely reflects the high level uh, library API. So here I just give an example of uh, how the encrypt uh, API. Uh, uh, looks like, but yeah, you uh, you can expect this uh, similar thing for decryption for transfer. So we try to uh, to write a very uh, s simple high-level API. So in this case, you have just a simple encrypt function taking two arguments, uh, encryption options. So uh, something like uh, files that you want to encrypt, recipient, signer, um, uh, let's say compression level that you want to uh, to use. Uh, so just uh, some basic information that you need uh, uh, to create the package and destination. And uh, here we want to try something more generic. So uh, so in principle you can 
encrypt either. Uh, so that's that's uh, what uh, that's the only thing that the Python implementation can do actually is to encrypt to to a local file system. With the Rust implementation, we are already able to not only uh, implement local but also uh, SFTP remote uh, destination. S3 is still a work in progress. Um, which also maybe hints on what we are trying uh, doing under the hood. So as uh, is already Christian mentioned that we need to support actually quite a massive uh, data uh, sizes sometimes, so sometimes in the order of terabytes. So we need to be careful with how we use, we use resources. So pretty much the entire workflow is uh, streamed. So uh, basically in memory, um, passing from one uh, uh, pro, uh, one function to call it uh, to another. So compression, checksumming, uh, um, encryption, and then saving to a destination happens in a single stream. So there is no data stored temporarily or in the case of a remote destination, then it's uh, saved directly uh, at the remote. Uh, so no extra storage is used uh, on the computer that is uh, performing the package creation. And yeah, um, mm, and one caveat here, so the code that you see here, it's still a bit of a mock-up. Uh, so it's, it's, it should uh, soon land on the uh, main branch, but it's not there yet. So hopefully we can make the high-level API as nice as possible. And yeah, it's also important for us to do it that way because uh, then this, uh, this API will consume ourselves in the CLI and also we need to expose it to Python. So uh, if, uh, if, if it's as simple as possible, then uh, it's very uh, good for ourselves even. Okay, and as promised, uh, so this is how you would uh, then uh, expose your code to Python. So here you will see that uh, yeah, it mostly looks like uh, I mean, actually, it is uh, uh, mostly Rust code, but with some uh, extras. So you will see here the two uh, macros, and they are coming from Pyro3. And uh, basically, they turn these um, uh, function definitions into something that can be then um, packaged into a Python module. So the first one uh, uh, just converts a Rust function into a Python function, and the second creates a Python module. And here you will see that uh, once you create a, Py, uh, a module, then you just add things to it, like in this case, uh, this encrypt function. And you can also add uh, classes. You can add uh, uh, pretty much uh, everything that you, you would need uh, uh, in an easy way. And, um, and then uh, uh, here in, in the comments, uh, you will see how you would call it in Python. So just like uh, any other Python code, uh, you call a function with arguments and that's it pretty much. And yeah, so Pyro3 gives a lot, still it's not perfect. So for example, it doesn't work with generics, at least not yet. So uh, so yeah, that's why this, uh, this API is a bit uglier than the one that I showed on the last slide. Okay, then I will switch a bit gears and talk about maintenance or so something maybe not very exciting, but definitely something that most people need to do. And especially uh, in this project, we need to support a lot of platforms. And yeah, so basically co compile against a lot of targets, which means that we, yeah, we need to somehow make it easy for ourselves, automate as much as possible. Uh, so here I will show you a bit what we do in this context. And here I also uh, linked a very nice talk from Rust Nation UK, which uh, goes uh, much deeper into uh, the maintenance of a Rust project. Uh, but yeah, two messages that I took from it that are relevant here. It's uh, like, be careful on which dependencies you take because you need to, to live with those choices. Of course you can replace, but sometimes it comes at the cost. And second, yeah, uh, try to be up to date. So it's okay to uh, delay uh, updates, but yeah, just don't ignore them. And yes, yeah, so then, as I mentioned, yeah, we try to make a heavy use of CI and automation because what we need to do, so here uh, you'll see uh, like an overview of our CI. So of course we want to test. We also need to test against multiple platforms. Unfortunately, uh, on GitLab, we can uh, have native runners for Linux, Mac, and Windows. So at least we can make sure that it compiles natively on those platforms. We also need to build Python packages for three different operating systems for two different archi architectures. So 
uh, x86 and ARM64, and also uh, the, the RAS CLI binaries, also for three operating systems, also for two architectures, and also for Linux, we will build for both glibc and Muscle. So hopefully this will even satisfy CentOS 7. And uh, fine, uh, and yeah, so that's that's what uh, what runs uh, usually in the pipeline. So we try uh, also uh, since we have a lot of dependencies, uh, the builds can uh, run quite long. So we also do heavy caching, and also uh, since uh, the last release or two releases ago of Rust, there is sparse registry that also greatly uh, speeds up the CI. So yeah, we are trying to make use of all of uh, the new uh, good things coming and yeah also so and once we are ready with uh, for release then we can just uh, push uh, new tags to uh, to the uh, to the repository and the ci then creates um, uh, python packages uh, for for the uh, python binding crate and uh, and cli binaries for for the main crate so here you would see an example of i think it's a previous release of the uh, Python binding. So if you're familiar with Python, then you would notice that yeah, it's a Python package index, and here you will just see uh, those packages uh, as uh, as you would uh, see for any other purely Python project. And as for the uh, Rust uh, CLI, we store it uh, at this moment at least uh, just on uh, a GitLab uh, packages I think it's called uh, so yeah uh, so then you can just pick uh, binaries uh, from there and here exactly you can see uh, all the targets that, uh, that we are uh, compiling and, and yeah this cross uh, we, yeah, we need to do some cross compilation which is a bit tricky because we have some C libraries but yeah after some effort it it works so so we are quite happy with that and in terms of releases, so I think everyone likes nice changelog and uh, when stuff is nicely documented, but it's extremely annoying to write yourself, especially try to figure out what, uh, what changed since the last release. So we also uh, want to automate it. And here we, uh, yeah, so first uh, we uh, always write our commits in the conventional commit uh, syntax. So then they are actually nicely machine uh, readable and also human readable. And then we use this uh, uh, tool called the Git Cliff, which happens to be also written in Rust. Um, and it's, it's an extremely flexible uh, um, generator for changelog. And yeah, so that's pretty much how we uh, get nice changelogs without pretty much any effort. And also, yeah, uh, we, need, uh, we want to have separate releases for both of the crates. So, uh, so we wrote a very simple uh, script uh, in this case, just just a bash script that that uses the Git cliff and then some uh, Unix uh, tools to uh, to nicely uh, uh, um, to, to create changelog for each of the uh, uh, crates and then uh, tag them with correct next uh, release based on like if there are any breaking changes, new features, or just bug fixes. And as of staying up to date, so it's also quite annoying to just check if there are any new versions of all the dependencies that, that you have. So um, yeah, uh, we looked on some solutions. So a popular one is I think called Dependabot, but it only works for GitHub. So it was not a choice for us. We came across a renovated bot, which actually uh, works quite well for us. And what it does, so here's an example. So uh, on a given schedule that you can just define, uh, it will check uh, if there are any dependency updates uh, for your project. And if they are, again, on a given schedule that, uh, that you want. So for example, we only do it for on weekend, so we are not annoyed during the working week. Uh, yeah, it will create um, MRs uh, for, for the project. So let's say here, you notice that there was a new Rust release, so it created an MR. And if you see here in the bottom, the pipeline failed. Which is which is uh, maybe a bit unfortunate, but at least uh, it's something that we can easily check. And actually, in this case, there were some new uh, Clippy linters, which improved our uh, suggested improvement to our code, which actually were quite nice. So, uh, so without much effort, we just fixed the linting problems, and we are running again at the latest uh, Rust version. And yeah, so the same happens for uh, for crates that we are depending on. So. That's, uh, that saves us uh, quite a lot of time uh, in the long term. 
and also uh, it uh, so this uh, renovate bot creates uh, like a permanent issue that that uh, keeps track of uh, like uh, what, what MRs have already been opened. You can also close some if you really don't want uh, to update a certain dependency. And also you can see what will be created uh, in the next uh, uh, MR window. So, so you, uh, you can also uh, fast forward it or just wait uh, for, for, the, for the window. And yeah, then going to the next section, let's talk about the future and yeah so we need to predict and predictions are hard especially like if we think about the future so uh so yeah it's always yeah, difficult to predict but we uh we at least i identified a couple of things that we know that uh, that we need to improve so some of uh the, the things that uh, they are present in the python code base are still need to be migrated to, to us but it's it's uh, already uh, not so many uh things to do uh, there are other things that we identified as uh, uh, improvements. So, for example, uh, we uh, okay we uh, measured that we are actually quite good in terms of performance. So we are already uh, faster than the Python version, which wouldn't maybe be surprising. But actually, the uh, the, uh, the uh, Python code co calls uh, underlying like C libraries. So. Uh, so it's not like we are competing against interpreted code. We are competing against also compiled code. So so it's nice that we are already faster, but I think we can do better. Uh, so here in this plot, I mean, if you want, you can also open it in a new tab and explore it. It's in an interactive profile, but uh, but you don't need to read much uh, in uh, like text on it. I can just explain you that yeah, there are these two blocks and which represent like two uh, stages of the workflow that takes the most time. The left one, it's about compressing the data and the right one is, uh, uh, it's about uh, encrypting the data. And those two run on separate threads. So in principle, they run in parallel, meaning that the, uh, the speed of the entire workflow is limited by the, by the longer one, so compression. And yeah, probably we cannot do much more about uh, speeding up compression other than multi-threading it. And there's a nice library, a Rust library, uh, GZP, which I really try to include, but yeah, it has some um, uh, uh, strong const uh, constraints on what uh, types you can uh, use it with. Uh, so yeah, so it's a bit hard to, uh, to, to satisfy the compiler uh, to work in our workflow, so this will require more work, but obviously it's something that we need to uh, do at some point, especially to, to speed up this like multi-terabyte uh, data transfers. And second big one is, as I mentioned, yeah, we now have support for a local file system for SF remote SFTP, but as Christian mentioned, we are slowly moving to S3 because it feel, fits uh, our overall architecture much better than SFTP. And yeah, but still we don't have support in set for uh, direct encryption to S3, which uh, like, okay, for SFTP it was actually uh, surprisingly easy to do because of the type system. Uh, yeah, the type system basically guided uh, us how, how, to, uh, uh, how to implement it for uh, SFTP. For S3, the API is quite different and it's unclear uh, how to do it. I mean, it's definitely possible, but we just need to spend a bit more time on it. And yeah, what's maybe also quite uh, surprising is that yeah, we didn't implement it uh, in Python because actually it wasn't uh, obvious how to do it. So it was easy, easier in Rust. And yeah, the next thing that we still want to uh, improve, so packaging, as I mentioned in Rust, it's, it's a, it has a, already a good story because you have just a binary that you can pretty much give it to a user and run it. But our users are not very technical, so uh, still some having like an easy installer native to operating system would be great, including a self-updater. So there is a new release, they get a pop-out, they click, yes, I really want to uh, update, and that, that would be it. And then, yeah, so the big uh, thing that is still missing is GUI. And once we have GUI, it would be nice to have just a single executable that could be used with both uh, interfaces. Yeah, so that's uh, that's for the distribution. But yes, I mentioned the big missing component is uh, the GUI. And yeah, GUI in Rust, it's a bit of a complicated topic. So if you check this uh, this page, it lists 
at, uh, maybe not most, but I still a lot of uh, GUI frameworks in Rust. They have all different features, different problems. And so, yeah, it's unclear, at least to us, which one will be the best. But at least from what we saw and uh, think that, uh, or the features they, they would provide, so, uh, so we identified Tari at least as the one that would be solving the installer self-updater integration to the operating system problem uh, yeah so the, uh, so that would be already great uh, the one problematic or maybe not problematic it's a design choice uh, yeah it's uh, uh, so tower is a backend for which you need to write a front end so like the popular ways are to just use some javascript uh, frameworks like react uh, yeah which we would really prefer to avoid and so, so here I think we'll try to use you which is a uh, um, a, a Rust front-end framework compiling to WebAssembly, so perfectly compatible with uh, with Tauri. And actually, so yeah, so this is actually uh, just, uh, it's a real example, so a screenshot of a real app, so definitely it's possible to do it. Uh, yeah, um, probably we'll go for it, unless maybe one of you has uh, already great experience with uh, uh, another GUI framework, so I would be happy to talk about it. Uh, but if we were to go for you, this means that maybe Christian's dream of having everything in the browser could be fulfilled. Uh, so yeah, frontend would already be built to, with a WebAssembly. Uh, compiling the backend would be quite difficult, at least at this moment, especially like a multi-threading support is still a very experimental in the WebAssembly. Uh, file handling with browsers is also by design not that easy, but yeah, let's see. Maybe that would be possible at some point, so we are not excluding uh, that uh, in the very long term. Uh, so finally time to sum up. So what we show you is our journey from Python, which felt like a very reasonable choice at the beginning because it's like you know, a Python philosophy, it's easy to start with, which, which it was but it was difficult to maintain and very complicated to distribute and support all the platforms, all the dependencies. So that's why we uh, chose to move in this case to Rust, which despite its steep learning curve proved to be a very a good choice, allowed us to, uh, for early bug detection and easy maintenance and distribution. And yeah, also, uh, Good, uh, good CI and automation saves you time. So, uh, so yeah, that's also what we can really uh, suggest to anyone who didn't want to spend time on it. Yeah, it, it's worth it. And yeah, so that, for now, that would be it. And yeah, so now would be time for questions and then time to relax. And yeah, just at the end, you have some uh, the most important references. And throughout, the, I mean, all the slides are pretty much clickable. So if you want to follow some of the uh, things that we uh, had on the slide, just try to click them. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Oh, you yeah, the first question. Ah, yeah. So I, I was a little bit late, but uh, I'm not sure if that was covered before I arrived. But uh, how do you manage the kind of chain of trust aspect of uh, GPT? Yeah. How do you get the public key? So that, so yeah, that's an entire topic on the on its own. So, uh, uh, so I'm not sure if you already saw this slide. Let me try to go back to it. Just I think pretty much the, one of the first slides. Exactly. So, uh, so uh, we have uh, this central service called the portal or the Biomat IT portal, which, uh, which pretty uh, okay. So for re, uh, for the keys themselves, we use uh, this keys openpgp.org key server, which, uh, I mean, which holds the keys and does the uh, basic verification. So it will send you an email, uh, which would confirm that at least this key belongs to a person who can access uh, this email address. So at least you, uh, you are reasonably convinced that uh, the key is associated with this email address. And so that would be one layer and second layer uh, on, on this portal, uh, uh, we require users to, um, uh, to, to register their keys. And also um, uh, portal has like two factor authentication with a trusted identity provider. So uh, probably you're familiar with switch at OID. 
so it's uh, it's like a Swiss uh, educational uh, identity provider. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so so this allows uh, also to link uh, so at least link uh, the account with real person, real researcher, uh, let's say. And then uh, also we require that the email address would be matching between this identity and the key, and the email address has been verified uh, by the key server. And also, if necessary, we can, uh, because it's also a human act of uh, approving the key, so then if a human is unsure about, uh, so it's like a central authority in the end, so if the central authority is unsure, then they can still reject the key or ask for additional confirmation. So that's, that's within the Biomet IT, outside, no. Uh, we don't, uh, we cannot assure it, but uh, at least, uh, like, still you can not maybe use like the classical web of trust, but still uh, you can you can use some form of it uh, if you want locally. Basically, the, the portal provides. Uh, uh, it's also. Kind of Yes, so it provides an API endpoint that set can query and ask, uh, okay, uh, is this uh, key really trusted? Yes. Next question. Uh, so you, you basically started writing this thing, like it was first written in Python, then you rewrote it in Rust. Yep. As you mentioned uh, in the summary in the end, Python is really good for getting started in cross platform and things like that. So if you if you had to redo it, would you like would you, would you advise this? Is it a good strategy to first do it in Python to get the prototyping and then do it in Rust, or would it have actually worked or be reasonable to write it in Rust? From the beginning, did you know uh, so, okay, in this specific case, like three years ago, I would say it wouldn't be maybe optimal to write it in Rust because like Sequoia would be missing at this point, which would be like uh, the central point for the application. So still you might need to use something like GNU PG, which, yeah, which would be annoying in the same way as for the Python implementation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but otherwise, Actually, okay, also like now I'm quite comfortable with Rust, so I would not start some, like a new project knowing that, yeah, like I would just prototype it in Rust uh, these days, but... It's good enough, you don't need to use Python to prototype. Yeah, uh, at least in my case, yes, um, because actually I quite, uh, I now, now I enjoy Rust more than Python. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, so that, uh, but on the other hand, if I were talking to a person who doesn't know Rust, yeah, just do it in Python. Uh, just uh, do a prototype in a language you know, so you don't waste time learning the language if, uh, before you, you actually know that the idea makes sense. And maybe you have to think about if you have to share this code, right? I mean, you are the only one which is really confident with uh, this. But, but then you, are, you guys are catching okay. up, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, also that's, that's one of the other problems, like, yeah, how about your colleagues? Like, uh, if, if, if you're working in a team that uh, you, at least you need to convince them that Rust is a good choice, mm -hmm. Uh, so they can learn it if they don't know it already. Yeah, so that's that's also a bit challenging at the beginning. Yeah, uh, well, two questions. Um, first, did you look at other PGP uh, implementations in Rust, like the SMTP PGP RS? Uh, it's a bit smaller than the PGP RS. Actually, no, actually, this one I missed. Well, it's, it's probably more focused on the encryption and signing part, and I guess you also. Key management is actually quite, yeah, I mean, very important for us and also quite tricky, so. Yeah, yeah so we also looked at, yeah, the, the uh, JavaScript uh, library that Christian mentioned, but obviously it wouldn't be a right choice. And there, uh, so that's made by a company con called Proton, uh, which is behind the Proton Mail uh, product. And they also have a Go library for the backend part, but yeah, I mean, none of us knew Go and also like, uh, yeah, I mean, there are some strong opinions about both Rust and Go, but yeah, at least like before knowing one of those languages, uh, yeah, so somehow we would need to make a choice, but still Rust, uh, uh, like from the opinions and also from Gary, of course, uh, was a, a more, uh, a better choice for us than uh, going the go direction. Yeah, no, Rust is. <laughs> I mean, you are here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just like I don't know. I just once looked at Sequoia, and, and it seems a bit 
complex, like very many modules and all They that. are, so, so now they are simplifying, also splitting a bit. So they, uh, uh, they at the beginning, I think they only had a monorepo. Now they try to create uh, more separate repositories where uh, when it uh, makes uh, most sense. So for example, the SQ binary until like a few weeks ago, it was part of the, the main repository. Now. It has its own, uh, also the key store now has, uh, I mean, the, they are, they just started with the key store and they created a separate repository for that. So now it's actually, uh, I think, more approachable. Um, but still, yeah, I mean, like uh, when I was implementing uh, like uh, the main workflows and trying to go through the Sequoia API, it took me a while to, mm -hmm. uh, to just understand what's what and uh, how to use it. But at least like the typing helps you a lot. So. So my second question is, uh, I mean, often PGP is this sort of very old format and it's probably not ideal, uh, but it's for email, it's still the yeah. common thing. So are you enforcing like any kind of like modern encryption there or is it just like <sighs> ESA? Yes, yeah, so that's also a problem that we were not able to solve until we moved to Rust because of supporting uh, yeah, the infamous CentOS 7. We need to support GNU PG, a version that is long outdated and doesn't support almost, actually, no, no uh, uh, I think it's any it's elliptic curve uh, algorithm. So pretty much you're stuck with RSA. So that's why we were not able to enforce, but now uh, once we completely migrate to, to Sequoia, we can, we can uh, start enforcing uh, modern uh, encryption algorithms, yes. Uh, so, sorry, I can barely see. Okay, no, now it's better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, no, go ahead. Oh, we do have. So actually, we have kind of a double encrypt. Uh, so protocol, you mean the transport layer? Uh, yeah. yeah, we we do. So I mean, like, uh, so uh, SFTP and S3 are encrypted as, but still, uh, the idea is to not trust the intermediates. So the package actually travels uh, through the network and it's stored on the disk. So in principle, like sysadmins could read it, and it uh, 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 and what we are transferring is like. Uh, patient data from hospitals. So it's uh, really something that you don't really want to leak in any way. So to be like completely on the safe side, really end-to-end -end encryption. Yep. Actually, the, uh, um, the show that uh, most of the time goes into um, graphic. Um, to compression. compression and then to yeah, encryption. But, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, this one. And, and then I suppose even longer time goes because you, you said that you're doing stream processing. Uh, yes. Are you uh, uh, chunking the stream processing in, in so that you can uh, do parallel processing? And in the end, when you transfer the data over, uh, over the transport protocol, uh, for example, S3 mm -hmm. allows you to upload multiple chunks. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's one of the big reasons why we are moving to S3 pretty much because of uh, the parallel uh, upload. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, still we don't have streaming support for S3 because of uh, yeah, it's it's not uh, uh, at least doesn't seem to be trivial to implement. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. One a biggie. Uh, but uh, so at least at this moment, we are not really concerned about the uh, the transfer speed because we are really limited by uh, either compression. Okay, data could be compressed already. Then you can skip compression step and just go purely for encryption. And okay, I would need to double check it, but I'm quite sure that still transfer is slower than encryption. So. Uh, so even if you uh, saturate the uh, the transfer, it's still you're limited by compression. But yes, but then if you do mul uh, multi-stream with like S3, then you uh, yeah, yeah then you might be uh, reaching the the limit of the either compression or, or encryption. So I can Okay, very very nice. So so yeah, we should definitely talk. <laughs> So 
Uh, so, yeah, we have it as an option. I um, mean, so one of the... Uh, where I don't know it connected, was... I think. You have to... Ah, to ah yeah, okay. So I need... Ah, yeah. yeah. Ah, it's there, right? Maybe you can... We can... Uh, no, okay, okay. Good. Yeah, so uh, uh, if I understand your question correctly, so you're asking, like, uh, uh, when we use muscle, right? No, so uh, if you see the target here, yeah, okay, so we have it for, uh, yeah, just uh, x86 and then for, uh, yeah, here for uh, ARM64. So that's, uh, those are the two uh, muscle uh, binaries that we create. Can, uh, sorry, uh, I wanted to. Uh, do you know of any other that would be useful? Ah, no, uh, no, 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 not much experience. I just tested that it works. I didn't test performance. Uh, I don't know, actually, maybe I did. And uh, I think I did, and like a, and a very rough test showed that it's very similar because at least uh, like the, uh, the heavy part is uh, it's still written, I think, in Rust. Uh, so, uh, or actually, that, that's, I'm not sure if it matters. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so like uh, from performance perspective, I think I didn't notice any difference. So it's mostly like uh, here would be like how portable it is. So muscle is uh, like the most portable thing. Like uh, especially on CentOS again. Uh, I okay, so still this would I, th if, I think even the glibc, uh, so the uh, the GNU one here would work on, still on CentOS 7, but not on CentOS 6, which I believe still some people use. Uh, so, uh, uh, so muscle here would help, I, I believe. I didn't test it, but I would assume so because, yeah, there is nothing but the kernel uh, to, to to be a limit here. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, and just uh, the compression format, you you are obliged to use a given format. Like, uh, you could use any kind of compression algorithm. Uh -huh. So we are not uh, forced uh, to use any, uh, which should still be backwards compatible, at least for the um, decompression side. Uh, yeah, but um, so we kind of are, like arbitrarily uh, chose uh, gzip, uh, but yeah, still I'm not sure if there are much better choices. Do you, okay, you do, okay. Okay, good, good. So that would be very, very, very good to, to learn. <laughs> Right. And we were doing having a good result with the Z tool on the function in the file. And you actually built it in Rust in your in your software. It's not a library, it's a tool, so yeah. Okay, so it and it doesn't expose any library. It's possible to do something. I'm not saying I'm not trying to sell my solution, I'm just like uh, sure. asking what was the uh, so like with Python, it, it, it felt like a good starting idea and it stuck. Uh, the problem that is giving you is that uh, it requires uh, C library. It's uh, just the Rust layer is... But can you statically compile it at least? Can you statically compile it at least? Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so I mean, we already do it like for uh, uh, leap uh, uh, SSH and open SSL, so. ZSTD gives you thin fingers. In terms of speed, you mean? or co and, and oh, Also compression. compression also. Okay, okay. That. Kind of, you can configure it. Okay, that's, uh, so that's something definitely I want to try and, mm -hmm. and see. Does it work with multiple uh, threads? Yeah. yeah. It's, oh. uh, Sounds good. Uh, so yeah, we definitely need to talk later. Uh, there was another question. <laughs> you stay here. <laughs> so you said you want to avoid uh, making a front end with Ruth React, but actually it could be a feature also just to look at the progress later on once you have the computer and the Rust program just can, can run in the background. So actually it wouldn't have a event. I thought that Rust would make challenge with making UI. So what makes you I don't think not so. consider uh, the last case? Uh, 
I mean, so I'm not a big fan of JavaScript. <laughs> Maybe that's. Uh, uh, no, 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 he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so that, uh, that would be uh, maybe not a very good argument, but uh, yeah. maybe a better one would be okay, uh, like then you have two languages in your code base, mm -hmm. and then you need to, to have people that can work with both. I mean, of course, it's much easier to find a JavaScript developer than a Rust developer. But maybe another one would be that you can share code at least between the back end and front end, so at least some of the models, uh, maybe some other things. So. So at least maybe you would uh, be able to reduce some of the interface code between yeah. the, the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, have you ever seen you? Well, have you mentioned that? It's, it's a Rust web assembly kind of framework that is, I think it's inspired by React. Yeah, it's exactly, it's, it's inspired by React. That's exactly true. Yeah. And it's a very nice thing. The other, Thing would be have you considered going like nat native Rust with like um, Heist, for example? I, I, I checked that, but uh, it looks very promising, but then I'm not sure about the packaging story, installer, and stuff because that's that's very important for our users mm. and for us. I mean, uh, yeah, for us because we would need to support them. Yes. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so so I mean, uh, I, I definitely uh, also like Igui uh, would be another choice, but again. I'm unsure about uh, the distribution part. We have a team that created like this desktop application in ICE that is like for like trading views and all that. Okay. They're distributing this for different operating systems, but it's not my team. I, I can't say how. Okay. I mean, uh, I mean, definitely before writing maybe anything bigger than a prototype in Tauri, we we will also try it in ICE, maybe in Igui yeah. and. And see, not to repeat the pro, like uh, the thing with Python. Okay, Python works, so let's just go for it. I like, think yeah. For your UI, it's better to have something that uses classical widgets and components. Yes. You don't need like a. No, very interactive. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, 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 like, Igui, it's great, but it's probably uh, an overkill uh, for for such UIs. And Iced, uh, I, I never tried, honestly. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, for trading, you have to be very reactive, right? Probably. Yeah. And also plots, right? A plotting uh, or no? Yeah, you, you get all those graphs. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. With the web socket. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have that. No. Um, so it looks to me maybe I got something wrong with um, that you compress the file or the data and then you drift it and then you compress it again in the web uh, yeah, it seems that way, but uh, zip is uncompressed, so so we don't do double compression. So zip here it it purely serves a container uh, mm -hmm. role, so just to have a single file because also like yeah, uh, we wouldn't trust users to keep more than one file uh, like organized. So as long as it's uh, uh, they move a file, they move everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have to write any unpaid code. <laughs> oh, okay, so uh, fortunately the answer is no. <laughs> Good, yes, I'm very happy. Uh, uh, at one point it felt like the, uh, so there was one problem with like reading directly from a zip container that, uh, so the Rust zip library didn't provide it. So it felt like maybe here I would need to go for unsafe stuff, but it turned out that I could, because it's uncompressed, so I could just treat it as a raw binary and just read directly from it. Like knowing the bounds on the on the inner file that uh, that I mean I know it doesn't sound great but uh, but at least it's still safe for us. <laughs> uh, I think you were first. So, uh, I mean, so this is a very long shot and definitely not something that you want to try this year, probably not the next year. Uh, but yeah, so you uh, just compiles to WebAssembly because it's a front end library, so it needs to be uh, deployed at something like a browser. Uh, but in principle, you can compile pretty much any Rust code into WebAssembly. 
so uh, the, I, the long shot idea would be here instead of uh, like distributing uh, desktop applications or like command line applications, just uh, compile everything to WebAssembly and use it from browser. Uh, yeah, and here the challenge is that we still have some C dependencies like uh, OpenSSL, uh, libssh could probably go away uh, if we move fully to S3. And I don't remember other, maybe some compression stuff. It's also like uh, has a dependency on the C library. So those, I mean, you can compile C to WebAssembly, but the story is more difficult. And threading from what I read, it's very early. So it's a prototype stage. So yeah, so if there was no threading, then of course uh, performance would suffer a lot from that. But uh, I mean, it's an open source project, right? I mean, uh, any, what? Anyone can. Ah, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. The translation from Python to Rust, I assume you replaced the one Python module after the next one with Rust and then yep. ran a test to see if it's fine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Were you happy with this process in general? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was as smooth as possible, but still, uh, yeah, um, uh, interfacing between two languages, it's uh, a bit difficult. So Pile 3 does a great uh, job, but still doesn't convert any type to any type. So sometimes you need to uh, to, 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 to some wrappers and uh, to maybe infer some of the types, uh, yeah, which of course can produce an error. And also, yeah, because uh, you need to, let's say, report the progress of compression and transfer, then you need to somehow have callbacks from Rust to Python, which was also, I mean, maybe not complicated, but quite annoying to implement. So th there was like these small things that uh, were annoying, but uh, manageable. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, if uh, any one of you, it's uh, the point of like, okay, I have a Python project, I would like to solely translate it into Rust. Yeah, I can definitely recommend that it's, it's not that bad. I mean, so it actually is quite good. Uh, it's still not perfect, but not like just uh, staying within the same language. But yeah, it's, it's definitely quite good. And uh, for running it in the browser, I can suggest to stick with IDE, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, true. Some application that is implemented in IDE that does all this uh, self updating, whatever stuff. You can check. Uh, I think it's called rerun.io or something. Okay. It's a really cool uh, data analysis. Uh, Visualizer. Okay, and it runs both uh, as, as an app and, and on the browser, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we need just very basic. I mean, the most inter uh, like dynamic stuff we need is a progress bar. So, okay, uh, okay, that's very good to know. Uh, Did you write it down? Uh, no, I didn't. But I think I will just uh, later talk to you guys and just yeah. make sure that I know, I, I uh, keep the names uh, as, as as you mentioned. To see the recording. Ah, yeah, the recording, exactly, exactly. So that okay, that's that's very good. So yeah, but then I need to wait for the recording, and maybe I need to try it uh, tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Any further questions? If not, then the next step of today would be that we um, go to the Kentekwein, have some beer together if you want, or if you don't want, and relax. And thanks for the talk again. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for hosting us and thank you guys. That's it. Any input? Yeah. Um,